And we are live. What is up, everyone? Tyler Ramsey here, back with another live stream on the Hack Smarter Twist channel. Or maybe you're watching this after the fact on YouTube. Hey, it is cool to have you hanging out with me. It's an honor to have you here. I'm going to go ahead and get Twitch pulled up on the side. For those of you joining on Twitch, welcome. If you don't mind just sharing, hey, how did you stumble across the stream? Uh, what do you want to learn? And we'll, uh, we'll stumble through this and learn together. One thing I want to share before we get started is my Discord server. A cool place for y'all to hang out. Let me share my screen. I'm going to pop open to Discord. It is the Work Smarter Discord server. It, it has grown significantly. And I think what stands us apart is we have a meeting every Monday night where it's kind of an accountability meeting where we share two things. What did you accomplish this past week? And what are your specific learning goals for this week? It's a place to encourage one another and to make sure we're staying on track with our career and learning goals. So if that's something that interests you, come join. It's all completely free. We as the admins and moderators make no money from it, but it is a place to hang out. In addition, I am streaming live in this kind of like inception but in the box hacking channel on discord so you're welcome to chat on twitch or if you want to do voice chat and you want to ask questions while i do this come join discord and you can ask questions just know that if you do ask questions it will be shared on the stream it'll pick up your audio and also be shared on youtube so just keep that in mind but you're welcome to hang out on discord or on twitch whichever way works better for you and helps with your own learning let um, me pull this up for those of you on Twitch. If the music sounds off, audio sounds off, video sounds off, looks off, please ping me. Let me know because I can't, I can't tell. At least not, not very easily. All right. With all that set aside, we are going to start a brand new network today on the stream. I finished uh, all of the AD networks. At least the one that Amoeba Man came out with, and he's actually a member in our Discord and often joins us on Twitch. But I believe it's five in the morning where he lives or four in the morning. I don't remember in, in South Africa. So I don't know if he'll be joining us today, but we are gonna start the Holo network. I think I'm saying it right on TryHackMe. I posted the link in Twitch. Otherwise, if you have a TryHackMe account, just search for Holo and you'll be able to find it. But Holo is an active directory and web app attack lab that aims to teach core web attack vectors and more advanced AD attack techniques. This network simulates an external penetration test on a corporate network. You can kind of see how things are set up. Uh, we have these two servers right here. We have the domain controller. We have a file server and then two other servers that we don't know what they actually do. Now, in full disclosure, usually when I do these, I do them live, right? So I'm stumbling through it. I'm learning as I go. I have done the first 11 tasks or it looks like the first 13 tasks on this room. And the reason for that is I just wanted to make sure I wanted to live stream it, that it was a good network. And so for these first couple of the tasks, I have done them already, but we will go through it from the start. So if you want to completely follow along, um, you're welcome to. This will be part one of the series. Hopefully we make it through the entire network. You can see it is a big network and we're going to do some really cool stuff on it. So for these first few, I'm still going to go through all of it as if I'm doing it for the first time, but in full disclosure, I have gone through these first couple of the tasks. The other thing I like to encourage people with is when it comes to try hack me or learning in general, I think our tendency is a skim and to rush through things. And I would just encourage you when you're learning, when you're doing try hack me, we're doing hack the box or another lab, slow down, right? The goal is not to finish as fast as you can. The goal is to learn. And one of the ways that you can learn is slow down, read everything. So what I like to do when I'm on stream is I'm going to read every text and I'm going to read it out loud to force both me and you to slow down so we, we learn something as we do this together. All right. I think that's everything I have for introduction. I'm going to turn the music down a little bit on my end. It's a little bit loud. And let's go ahead and dig in, y'all. I have Kali Linux open. I haven't actually connected to the VPN. So I'll even guide you through how to do that initially for this network, because I know that's something that people seem to have some issues with in their first getting started. You can also use an attack box if you have a if you're a subscriber, it's like a virtual, it's a VM in your web browser. But I always encourage people install your own VM. It helps with troubleshooting. You can set up your own hacking environment and it's a lot easier than it sounds. I have a video on YouTube called start hacking today legally and actually walk through how to download VirtualBox, how to download Kali Linux ISO and how to get everything loaded and configured so that you are ready to get off to hacking. So if that, if that interests you, check it out. I need to adjust my chair. All right. I need a standing desk. Y'all is what I need. So if anyone wants to donate a standing desk to me, I, I will, I will happily accept it. Okay. 
let's go back whoop, let's go back to try hack me right here I'm just going to check OBS and make sure I have things recorded. Yep, everything's good on that end. All right, let's dive in. Generation 1, Holo Live. Welcome to Holo. Holo is an active directory and web application attack lab that teaches core web attack vectors in advance slash obscure active directory attacks along with general red teaming methodology and concepts. In this lab, you will learn and explore the following topics. .NET Basics, Web Application Exploitation, AV Evasion, Whitelist and Container Escapes, Pivoting, Operate with the CT, which is a command and control framework, Post Exploitation, Situational Awareness, and Active Directory Attacks. You will learn and exploit the following attacks and misconfigurations, misconfigured subdomains, local file inclusion, remote code execution, Docker containers, SUID binaries, password resets, client-side filters, app blocker, vulnerable DLLs, net NTLM version 2 SMB. Whew. This network simulates an external penetration test on a corporate network, Hol Holo Live, with one intended kill chain. All concepts and exploits will be taught in a red team and methodology and mindset with other methods and techniques taught throughout the network. This network brings you from zero to red team, but you are expected to have a general knowledge of basic Windows and Linux architecture and the command line for both Windows and Linux. If you need help, feel free to ask in the Try Hack Me Discord or follow along with my videos and we'll stumble through it together. I read the above. I already did that. Yes, patching into the matrix. Let's go ahead and get connected. To access the network, you will need to first connect to our network using OpenVPN. This is already pre-installed on Kali Linux for you. Here is a mini walkthrough of connecting to the hollow specific network. I will show you how easy this is, guys. People get intimidated by this because they think it's difficult, but it's not. Uh, first, I'm going to clear my old one. We'll do it from scratch. All right. Oh my goodness. We're just going to remove all of these. Let's go like this. Tenebrae star. Uh, let's see. What files do we have? Let's go like that. There we go. There. Okay. That lab one is my hack the box VPN. So on our VM, let's go to try hack me. Should already be logged in. You guys see that top one percent y'all okay let's jump to holo actually not holo we don't need to go there we already joined the room um you're actually going to click your profile up there click access and go to networks and holo live download my configuration file save file okay there it is Open VPN, Tenebrae. We're patched in, y'all. Let's name our tab VPN. Open a new, new tab. Jeez, cat blocks. We'll name this tab Terminal. And we should be patched in. Let's see if there's anything we miss. I don't think you have to put the domain controller in your uh, DNS, but let's find out. Blah blah blah. Yeah, that's all. That's all there is to it. So it says we can verify. We refresh. There we go. You can see that we are connected. There is our internal IP address. We are ready to hack some stuff. Okay. The kill chain. This is just showing what we're gonna do. I'll let you read through that on your own if you want to. We have the flag submission panel, right? So as we find different flags throughout the network, we'll jump back to this and submit our flags. Poning and prizes, this doesn't apply because when it was first released, if you complete it by September 15th and submitted a pen test report, you got some cool prizes. Well, we cannot go back in time. I'm not a good enough hacker to do that. So we can't get any prizes. All right, now this first part is a little bit weird and you'll see why because I feel like it's missing a task, but we'll just dive into it. An integral part of working with Windows and other operating system implementations is understanding C Sharp and its underlying technology, .NET. Many Windows applications and utilities are built in C Sharp as it allows developers to interact with CLR and 132 API. We will cover the infrastructure behind .NET and its use cases within Windows further below. .NET uses a runtime environment known as the Common Language Runtime, or CLR. 
We can use any .NET language, C Sharp, PowerShell, etc., to compile into the commonly common intermediary language CIL. So not that we can use a CLR. Uh, .NET also interfaces directly with 132 and API calls, making the optimal solution for Windows application development and offensive tool development. From Microsoft, .NET provides a runtime environment called the Common Language Runtime that runs the code and provides services that make the development process easier. Compilers and tools expose the Common Language Runtime's functionality and enable you to write code that benefits from this managed execution environment. Code that you develop with the language compiler that targets the runtime is called Managed Code. Managed code benefits from features such as cross-language integration, cross-language exception handling, enhanced security, versioning, and deployment support, a simplified model for component interaction, and debugging and profiling services. .NET consists of two different branches of different purposes outlined below. The .NET framework, Windows only, and .NET Core cross-compatible. So you think PowerShell Core is also cross-compatible. The main component of .NET is .NET assemblies. .NET assemblies are compiled EXEs and DLLs that any .NET language can execute. The CLR will compile the CIL into native machine code. You can find the flow of code within .NET below, right? You kind of look through this yourself. You can also decide to use unmanaged code with .NET. Code will, directly compile, code will be directly compiled from the language into machine code, skipping the CLR. Examples of unmanaged code are tools like Donut and Unmanaged PowerShell. Find a visual of data flow within both managed and unmanaged code below uh, within .NET. There also exists the dynamic language runtime. This concept is out of scope from the network. However, to learn about it, check out this article. Check it out, y'all. Now that we have a basic understanding of .NET and how it can interact with the system from .NET languages, we can begin developing and building an offensive tooling to aid us in our operations. Huh. Read the above and prepare to apply .NET theory with C Sharp. Now here's where it, here's where it doesn't make sense. Okay, let me show you guys something. So what it's going to do, let me just read it and then I'll explain it. An important tool of C Sharp in building offensive tooling is understanding how to compile your tools and tools without pre-built releases. To work with C Sharp and building tools, we will again utilize Visual Studio. So it says we will again utilize it as if we already utilized it in one of these tasks, which we haven't. It is important to note that Visual Studio is not the only C Sharp compiler, and there are several other compilers outlined below. Right there. In this task, we will be using Visual Studio, which I have Visual Studio code. Um, allows us to manage packages to build and develop we recommend using the Windows develop virtual machine That's just an ISO for Windows to begin using Visual Studio. You need a valid account It will begin our compiling journey. So what this does is it walks you through creating uh, a file in .NET But let me show you why this first task makes no sense, right? So it's saying once it's created You'll notice that it will break down dependency classes. From here, we should have a working automatically generated C-sharp hello world file that we can use to test our build process to build the solution file, blah, blah. Okay, so it's just talking through how to do this very basic stuff in uh, Visual Studio. But from what I can see, we don't actually get to it. Now, if we jump to this next thing, well, if we jump to here, I feel like it's missing a task here because it says we will again utilize Visual Studio. And then all they're doing here is making this hello world file um, and to build a solution file and then we get to build, blah, blah, blah. You should now have su successfully compiled the file that you can run and use on other systems with corresponding .NET versions, unless it's just referring to that hello world file that we're making. But anyways, if you want to take the time to do that, you can. I'm not going to, at least not on stream but feel free to do it on your own. We're going to dive directly into the hacking part of it, and maybe that stuff will come up later, and if it does, we'll, we'll go back to it. But before we get too overzealous in attacking web servers and hacking the world, we need to identify our scope and perform some initial recon to identify assets. Your trusted agent has informed you that the scope of the engagement is 10.200, and then whatever our subnet is, which what subnet are we on? 108, it would appear and 192.168.100.0. To begin the assessment, you can scan the ranges provided and identify any public-facing infrastructure to obtain a foothold. InMap is a commonly used port scanning tool that is an industry standard that is fast, reliable, and comes with NSC scripts. InMap also supports CIDR notation, so we can specify a slash 24 notation to scan 254 hosts. That means nothing to you, just Google it, right? It's basic networking. 
There are many various arguments and scripts that you can use along with Nmap. However, we will only be focusing on a few outlined below. So SV scans for services and versions. SC runs a script scan against open ports. Dash P dash scans all ports. If you don't do that, it only scans the most common ports. Dash V provides for both output. And here is our syntax. Um, Nmap dash SV dash SC dash P for all ports dash V for verbose. And then we're going to hit our network right there. Once you've identified open machines on the network and basic ports open, you can go back over the devices again individually with a more aggressive scan, such as using the dash A argument. The dash A argument throws all enumeration scripts at the machine. For more information about InNAP, we suggest complete the InMap room on Try Hack Me. So I'll, I'll walk you guys through some of this. Let me go to Try Hack Me, and you can see I already have a folder for it. Let's see what we all have here. So if we CD to InMap, um, if I cat InMap, whoops, LS. So that was the web server that we InMapped, okay. So some of these things just take time. And so I'm not gonna do it in its entirety, but I'll at least walk us through it a little bit. And so that if you're doing this on your own, maybe you can do it, pause the video and go on, but I've already done this. So if we just follow the example over here, if we do nmap, and you know what I would do? I would first just see what hosts are up, right? So instead of throwing all these scripts at it, let's just scan that IP range and see what hosts might be up. So it's 10.200. Was ours 101? I already forgot our subnet where we're on. Oh my goodness, it's tiny. 108? Is that what it is? Or 100? 108 it is 108. Okay. Got it. One oh, oh my goodness. Numlock wasn't on. So you can you can follow the syntax that it offers us. Or yeah, here we go. Be that dot zero slash twenty four for the cider notation. We'll do dash V for verbose. And you can see we're gonna scan two hundred and fifty six hosts. And what you'll discover if you go through this process is we are going to discover this public facing web server right here, the 10.200.108.33. And we have, even as you look at this, just so we understand some of what's going on here, I did ver verbose, so that's why it's doing this. And it's hitting every single IP octet on here to see like, are these machines up? And it's just pinging them. It's seeing, do, do we get a response back? So as we scroll through here, I want you to notice we have an open port on 108.250. So that's a machine that could be uh, maybe one of these file servers. We have 108.33. That's right there. That's going to be a web server. And we have port 80. That's how we know it's a web server because port 80 is the common port for HTTP. Port 22 is a common port for SSH for remote management. And so we have 108.250. And we have 108.33. So a good thing to do. Sorry, y'all. If you hear my cat, he wants to be on stream with us. If we go ahead and take a screenshot of these things. Um, oops. Let's do that again, shall we? Close. I'm going to go higher up. If we take a screenshot, it's always a good idea to take good notes as we discover stuff. Control C. I record my notes in OneNote. I'm sure there's a billion better ways to do it, but I started in OneNote. So I have all my things here, right? So as I take classes, I, I document, I try to document everything so I can go back to this, but we have boxes here and we're gonna start a new one. We'll call it holo for THM, try hack me. And we can go ahead and post this. So then we know we got two machines, right? 10.200.108.33 seems to be a web server. And we have the 10.200.108.250. And we're not sure what that is, at least not, not right now. But we have at least our screenshot saved here, so we can come back to it if we need to. The other thing that we could scan is that other IP range it gave us, which is normally like a local one but let's go ahead and 
scan that. So if we do the same syntax, we'll do 192.168.100.0. And there's other options for this. So you can change with dash T. Um, I can't think of what it stands for, but basically that's the aggression. So T5 is really aggressive, which means that if you're hitting a network with this, firewalls and all those things are going to pick it up quick knowing they're being scanned, whereas T1 is going to go slower. And there's also different scans you can do in order to not make a full, like if you think of the TCP three-way hand, handshake, it doesn't do the full handshake. So you can do ways a little, with a little more stealth if you're doing this in a real environment. And obviously only do this if you have permission. Don't don't go hack stuff and say that dude on YouTube told me to. Let's grab a drink. While that does its thing, let's just keep reading. Once you've identified open machines, we can do a, a stronger scan against it. So the way we would do that is we know we have a web server on 33, right? If I remember right. So it would be nmap. We could do, what I would do first is scan all the ports first. So we got 10.200.108.33, I think, and dash V. And that's gonna tell us what ports are open. If you try to throw more scripts at it, it's just gonna slow it down. I try to first figure out what ports are open, and then I do a, another scan, a more, a uh, scan with more scripts thrown at it, but then I scan the specific ports that are open, just cause it to go a little bit faster. Shoot, did I crash the web server? I hope not. <laughs> Sometime on these, you can crash them for doing too much scanning. Okay, that's going too long. So I'm gonna stop this scan right here. Just for now, we'll come back to it when we get to the, that IP range. But one thing that we're gonna do is I'm gonna do T5, up the aggression, up the speed. Let's see if that goes a little bit faster for us. So it finds port 22, it finds port 80. There is a third port, if my memory serves me correct. And if you look at the questions down here, right, was the last octave, the IP address, that's 33. Oh, dude, my cat's annoying. Can you guys hear my cat? A, so you can see that Amoeba Man said you can use dash dash max retries equals one to make it even faster, especially during OSCP. I did not know that. So I'm going to, whoops, I don't want to use the sniffing tool. Sniffing tool sucks. Use this. I'm going to grab Amoeba Man's comment. You guys don't see it, but I'm going to post it over here in my notes. All right, document everything. Therefore, we can come back to him. What up, Amoeba Man? Good to have you joining, my friend. Okay, so you can see we found these ports. We can keep going, but we know there's only three ports open. So then what I do, once I know what ports are open, I'm gonna do dash P and then we can target individual ports, right? So we can target port 22, which is SSH, port 80, which is gonna be a web server. And then we don't know what 33060 is. Dash A means let's throw all the scripts at it and then we'll type in the IP. We can do dash V for verbose. And then what I what I like to do is I like to output it to like inmap.txt. Now I will say I already did that. So I'll show you guys the result of that if we go to try hack me hollow. And like I said, I did the beginning of this already. But as we go on, I'll be stumbling through it live. I think this is my file here. So, geez. The syntax is screwy because I have my screen um, small like that. So you can see when I scanned it, it found those three ports and it's scanning different services on it. So like I guess port 22 is running SSH. SSH usually isn't a good attack vector, right? There's usually not a lot of weaknesses. Usually once you have creds or you can brute force and you can attack SSH. We have port 80. Now, there's a lot of interesting things here. So as it scans, it's looking at robots.txt. Now, robots.txt is saying, hey, here are things on my web server that I don't want a web engine or a, a web crawler to grab. Well, I don't think most websites use it now because a lot of attackers will just like immediately look at robots.txt. Often there's an admin log in there or something else juicy, right? But when you run this script, it's looking for it automatically. So we can see 
here's some disallowed entries and look what's interesting. It's giving us the full file path of WordPress, right? So it's probably running Apache and then we can we can see the, the file structure of where index.php is at and readme.html. We know it's running WordPress and we can see the full file structure. That That's, that's, a, that's a big no-no, right? And it looks like it's trying to redirect us to hollow.live. So we may have to add some settings to our, our um, Etsy host file to see some, maybe there's multiple URLs or websites running on one server. And then we have this 33060. It thinks it's some type of MySQL server. It could be something else, right? We have the question mark there. It's unrecognized despite returning data. Um, I'm sure we'll dig into that. So if you were to run that scan, that is a little bit about what you would see. Let's jump back to the task at hand and see what it's asking us. Okay, so you can see what CME is running on port 80 on the web server. So we can just go to the web server, right? 10.200.108.33. It's gonna be our web server. My cat really wants to be on stream. What up, cat? I can't even see him because it's so dark in my basement and my cat is black. Nope. I can only hear him. I really can't see where he's at. Okay. Well, it's slowly loading. It's being really slow. You know what? Let's look at, I think I know what's going on. From the last time I did this, I probably didn't clean up my Etsy host file. Yeah, so you see, I have the wrong things in here. Let's just let's just exit those out. Let's save that. And I think that's probably what's happening. Let's just start that over. Might work now. Maybe. I mean, I can't imagine Chrome would be faster for some reason. Hope I didn't like kill the web server <laughs> already. I don't know what I would have done to kill it. I'm just gonna ping it. I mean, it looks like it's trying to connect. Yeah, we can ping it. Okay, whatever. Firefox doesn't want to doesn't want to participate today. That's fine. Okay, so when we go here, you can see it says "Welcome to Holo Live." We have a picture that doesn't load, and we have some of that cool placeholder text. And we have this generate press thing right here. And if we look at the page source, which let's do that. There's a few interesting things that that should stand out to you, right? We have WP includes, which if you've done any type of WordPress stuff, you know, this is WordPress. And then one trick is if you control F in source and look for generator, I already see it. You can often get the WordPress version. I don't think this works on newer WordPress, but older versions of WordPress this is a good enumeration strategy. And you'll notice right here, we have meta name, generator content, WordPress 5.5.3. So we know it's running WordPress and we know the version just from looking at the source code. WordPress 5.5.3 and the HTTP title of the web server. Now, I think it actually is going to guide us through it, so I won't get ahead of ourselves. So if you're following along, you got that done. Task nine. After scanning the network range, you discover a public facing web server. You take to your keyboard as you begin enumerating the web applications attack service. Your target is L server 01 found from initial reconnaissance. Important to note, a large number of users have reported L Server 1 is crashing. This is likely due to multiple people running GoBuster and WFuzz at once. It is highly recommended that you reduce the thread account while attempting file and directory enumeration on L Server 1. And when I was doing this initially, I did break the web server. So we're going to be careful. And I may not even do the full scans, um, but I'll show you how to do them. Virtual hosts or vhosts are a way of running multiple websites on one single server. They only require an additional header, 
or host to tell the web server which vhost the traffic is destined. This is particularly useful when you only have one IP address but can add as many DNS entries as you would like. You will often see hosted services like Squarespace or WordPress do this. We can utilize GoBuster again to identify potential vhost present on a web server. Sorry guys, I'm turning up my music a little bit. Oh, that's almost too quiet. Here we go. Um, the syntax is comparable to fuzzing for directories and files. However, we will use the vhost mode rather than dir this time. Dash u is the only argument that we need a minor adjustment from the previous fuzzing command. What previous fuzzing command? I missed something. I don't think it talked about a fuzzing command, but whatever. Um, <laughs> dash u is the base URL that GoBuster will use to discover vhost. So if you use dash u, tryhackme.com, GoBuster will set the host to tryhackme.com and set the host header to host line one tryhackme.com. If you specify HTTPS, GoBuster will set the host to tryhackme.com and the host header to line one www.tryhackme.com. So be careful that you don't make this mistake when fuzzing. So here's the syntax, GoBuster, vhost, dash u is our URL to fuzz, and dash w is our word list. We recommend using the sec list subdomains top 1,111,000.txt word list for fuzzing vhost. WFuzz also offers V. Well, let's just do GoBuster real quick, shall we? Let's see if we manage to break the web server or not. Whoops, I didn't mean to do it that way. Um, let's see. Okay, so if we pull this up and if we do GoBuster. Which, by the way, I had to install this when I first did it. So if you do need to install it, it's really easy. Uh, you have to be logged in as root, which, by the way, I don't think the newer Kali Linux allows you to run as root. But if you just Google Pimp My Kali GitHub, there's a little bash script that you can run that re-enables root login. That's how I always log in as root. Otherwise, you have to do sudo, right? But if you're logged in as root, it's just apt install GoBuster, and it will install it for you. But I got it installed, so we'll type GoBuster vhost u is going to be our URL to fuzz. And it said, we have a specific way to do this, blah, blah. So if you provide u, HTTPS, if you specify that, Ghostbuster will set the host to that and set the host header. Wait, if you specify HTTPS, Ghostbuster set the host. I, I, I think I know what it's saying. Is that what it wants me to do? So if you provide dash u, try hack me, GoBuster will set the host to tryhackme.com and set the host header to host line one dot tryhackme.com. If you specify, wait, what's the difference? Oh, the difference is the www, right? So we do want to do HTTP like that, 10.200.108.33, like that. And I suppose dot com would be the way to do it maybe. So we have the URL, the fuzz, and then we need our word list, which I believe that word list they ask is on Kali. So if we do locate and subdomains top 1 million 1100 hundred dot text. Yeah, it is already loaded on Kali Linux. So then for our word list, whoops, paste. Maybe it's not .com. Maybe we're just supposed to specify the IP there. Oh, yeah, you would. You wouldn't do .com. I don't know what I'm thinking, y'all. Okay. So if you run through this, it's going to find a few different ones. It takes a little bit to run. You see we're at 0.30%. So we probably won't run this whole thing. But I'll just show you guys the syntax. All right, I'm going to stop this. And we'll show you the W fuzz way as well. It's, it's very similar. The only difference is you have to add fuzz where you're fuzzing. So um, WFuzz also offers vhost fuzzing capability similar to its directory brute force capability. The syntax is almost identical to the GoBuster syntax. However, you will need to specify the host header with fuzz parameter, similar to selecting the parameter when directory brute forcing. So 
wfuzz-u is going to be our URL. Same thing, 10.200.108.33. W is going to be our word list. We should be able to use that same word list. Dash H is we're specifying what the host is going to be. So it'd be fuzz, right? Do we do it? We don't. It'd be fuzz.10.200.108.33, I think, like that. Dash. Make this big to see the syntax. Dash dash hc. Okay, got it. So that's the things to hide. Um, oh my goodness, I, I'm breaking my stuff. I hate trying to do this on split screen. Okay. So then you do the host the status codes to hide. Okay, so that would be the syntax for that. And I'm guessing like. So same thing. We're going to run through it all. It's going to look for those. But as I said, I already did some of this work. So now that we have some vhost to work off fuzzing, we need a way to access them. If you're in an environment where there's no DNS server, you can add the IP address followed by the fully qualified domain and the target host here as the host file on Linux, blah, blah, blah. So you can see here are three domains that you'll find if you let it run through hollow.live, admin.hollow.live, and dev.hollow.live. And let me just show you how easy it is to add this to your Etsy host file. Um, there we go. Now you do have to do this as root to edit this. So if we just go 10.200.108.33, and then we're going to do hollow.live, 10.200.108.33, and we're going to do, shoot, I already forgot what they actually were. <laughs> what is it? Admin.hollow.live and dev.hollow.live admin.holo.live 10.200.108.33 dev.holo.live save and you see we can ping it it should be so now like if we just want to go to look at that we couldn't discover that before and if we reload this one if we go to HTTP well, even if we just reload this one, it should redirect us now to holo.live, HTTP 10.200.108.33. Uh, oh, no. So we'd actually have to go to HTTP holo.live. Well. I just need to click it. Huh. Did I type? Is it www? Do you have to add? Hold up. Oh, yeah, you have to add www to our Etsy host file. So, you guys, even when I do this ahead of time, it's been a few days, so it's still <laughs> like it's fresh. There. I bet that'll work. Hey, see, there we go. There we go. There we go. What the fuzz? Now that we have a basic idea of the web server's virtual host infrastructure, we can continue our asset discovery by brute forcing directories and files. Your target is still L server 01 found from initial reconnaissance, HTTP and HTTPS, DNS included, are the single most extensive and most complex set of protocols that make up one entity that we know as the web. Due to its complexity, many vulnerabilities are introduced on both the client side and the server side. Asset discovery is the most critical part of discovering the attack surface on, on a target web server. There is always a chance that any web page you discover may contain a vulnerability, so you need to be sure you don't miss any. Since the web is such a big surface, where do we start? Well, we ideally want to discover all the target on assets on the web server. This is much easier for the target to do because they can run a dir or ls in the root of the web server and view all the contents of the web server, but we don't have that luxury. Typically, there are a few protocols like WebDAV that allows us to list the contents. The most popular method is to send out connections to the remote web server and check the HTTP status. 
codes to determine if a valid file exists. 200 okay if the file exists or 404 file not found if it does not exist. This technique is known as fuzzing or directory brute forcing. There are many tools available to help with the method of asset discovery below is a short list of commonly used tools. I personally like Durbuster. It has a GUI, but I think because it has a GUI, it is a little bit slower. The first tool we will be looking at for file discovery is GoBuster. I might just show you guys Durbuster. From the GoBuster Cali page, we already did a little bit of GoBuster. It has multiple options, right? So we have URL, wordless extensions, and secure URL. There's a syntax. We can use a secless big.txt. And here is where it might crash. And it's due to multiple people running GoBuster and WFuzz at once. I think I'm the only one maybe on this specific subnet right now, only because it wasn't started when I first do dove into it. And we'll extend it right now. So we might be safe. So far it's up. But um, blah, blah, blah. Once again, I think on this, I'll show you guys the syntax. And we won't actually do a full scan just so we don't actually break it. So as you increase threads, GoBuster can become further unstable and cause false positives to skip over lines in the word list. Thread count will be dependent on your hardware. We recommend sticking between 30 and 40 threads. In the real world, you always want to be mindful of how much traffic you're sending to the web server. You always want to make sure you're allowing enough bandwidth for actual clients to connect to the server without any noticeable delay, right? You're not trying to do a denial of service attack. If you're in a red team setting where stealth is critical, you'll never want to have a high thread count. The second tool we will be looking at is WFuzz. From the WFuzz GitHub, WFuzz is a tool designed for brute forcing web apps. It can be used for finding resources, not links, such as directories, servlets, scripts, etc. Brute force Git and post parameters for checking different kinds of injections. It brute force forms parameters, user password fuzzing, etc. As you can see, WFuzz is a comprehensive tool with many capabilities. We will only be looking at a thin layer of what it can do. Compared to the GoBuster syntax, it is almost identical. Find the syntax arguments below. Yep. The critical distinction is WFuzz requires the fuzz parameter. You can see that there. WFuzz also offers some advanced usage. Hide status code, hide word count, hide line count, hide character count. These parameters will help find specific things more accessible. For example, if you're fuzzing for SQL I, you know that an internal server error will occur if an invalid character is entered, the database query will fail, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, you already saw the answer to one of these. But I'll show you guys, I'll show you Durbuster just because I personally like Durbuster. So, Durbuster is built into Kali Linux, I believe. And what I like about Durbuster, especially if you're new to this, is it gives you this helpful little GUI, right? And it kind of guides you through it. So we want to do HTTP, um, you know, we want to do www.hololive, I suppose. So if we start with that, like that, we can do our number of threads, right? We do 100 threads, but we don't want to crash it. We'll just do like 50. Usually I go, usually I go, go faster. Um, but I don't know if we should do that or not. Ah, screw it. Let's see what happens. Uh, we're looking for a word list. So on Kali, a uh, word list I often use for good or for bad is in user, share, whoops. Oh my goodness. Share, word list, Durbuster. I like to use this directory list medium.txt right there. And the rest of this, you should be able to leave blank. And if we hit start, oh, we have to specify the port. Do I have to go like that? And uh, what this is doing is exactly what it said. So you can see we found WP content, we found admin, we found WP login. It's going to go through all these things. I'm not going to let it go through, but I would encourage you to do this. And if you do any type of CTFs or enumeration, this is one of the, any type of, so any type of web app I do, there's really three things I do. Um, I think three. First, in map, right? Figure out what ports are open, then do a more targeted scan with the dash A, right? So in map, see what our ports are. If we have a web server, I kick off Durbuster. Let's see if there's hidden directories that might be of interest to us, anything that any scripts that might be hidden, right? So we have Durbuster, and I use Nikto. 
which I don't know if this will go into it. Nikto is a very simple web app scanning. The syntax is just Nikto, which is N-I-K-T-O space dash dash H for host, and then the IP. And it's a very simple web scanner. I'll show you guys Nikto real quick because I don't know if this room goes through it. I'm going to stop this scan, but you can see it, it's running through here finding a bunch of stuff. If we did Nikto, it would be Nikto dash H HTTP www.holo.live. And it's going to scan through here and see what we can find. It enumerates the server for us right there. It'll actually, I believe, find that robots.txt has interesting stuff in it. So if we, we already saw that in our in-map scan too, if you remember right, we looked at robots.txt and saw some interesting stuff. So if we go to robots.txt, look at that. It tells us the full file path of what it looks like on the web server, which, right, that's a, that's a big no-no. You don't, you don't want that showing up. And so what file leaks the web server's current directory? Well, robots.txt does that very thing, right? What file loads images for the development domain? Okay, this one's a little bit more tricky. We'll see if I even remember how I discovered it. So the development domain, if you remember, is, uh, was it the dev, dev dot something? Dev.holo.live, okay, so let's go to that. Dude, I'm hungry, y'all. I can't really eat chips while I do this, so you guys don't want to hear me crunching. <laughs> so, welcome to holo.live, an all-new redesign. So what was the question it was asking? What loads the images? What script loads the images? Right? What f Oh, what file loads images for the development domain? What file? So we could scan this, right? We could do the Durbuster route as well. But if we just if we just click through here, right? If we click about, about's not giving us really much of anything. Who are we? Talents. Let's click talents. So here's our talents. Now I think these are the only images we have. If we click home, I don't believe there's any images on home besides these logos. Yeah. So I bet it's referring to these images right here. And if we do our classic view page source, let's read through the source a little bit, okay? So obviously it's HTML. We have this interesting free HTML template. That's cool. We have the Twitter, Facebook integration, all that stuff. We have our style sheets. Gosh, I can't scroll in, v in when I'm in my VM. For demo purposes only, <laughs> you can delete this anytime. Well, they didn't delete it, which you know, they likely missed other stuff as well. For IE9 below, oh, so anytime I see that, guys, moment of silence for Internet Explorer. All right, moment of silence is done. Rest in peace, Internet Explorer, along with Netscape and all the other old web browsers. Okay. So we have one image right there. That's just the logo, I think, the Holo Live. We keep scrolling down. Okay, so look at this. Here's our images, Corone, that, and notice what is pulling these images in. We have an href tag right here, and we have a PHP file. Now this is interesting, it's image.php file, and now it's equaling and it's pulling this file from the web directory. Now, this is where it began to click for me right away. If you've done any web app testing, you know, huh. I wonder if we can have used abuse image.php question mark file equals and we can look at any file that might be on the web server abusing that PHP script, right? That's that's where we're gonna go. So if you were thinking in that way, you're, you're tracking, you're tracking well. So what file loads images for the development domain and what is the full path of the of the credentials file on the administrator domain? Okay, so I'll show you guys how we get to that. I believe it was just in robots.txt. If we go here, we have this var ww admin super secret creds.txt. Okay, and once again, we have the full file path. Not a good idea. Now, if you know it's Apache, you can kind of guess what the file path might be, but you probably shouldn't include the full file path there right so it's asking that 
I don't know what the hint is. Robots.txt, yeah. Always check robots.txt, y'all. It'll save you time. Leroy Jenkins. For the actual for the following sections on web application exploitation, we have provided a development instance of a test server to practice attacks before moving over to the actual production web server. To set up the test environment, you will need to install Apache 2, PHP, and the environment files. Follow the steps outlined below. Truly, just follow these steps. I already followed them. I will show you one that might trick you up is maybe the configuration file. But let me see if I even have all my stuff up there. So if we open this up. Um, so you can see this is our Nikto.h scanner that we were running. Not to uh, like squirrel and jump, jump around. But you can see it found... This in robots.txt return a non forbidden or redirect HTTP code so we can see it's giving us the full version. We see robots.txt contains 21 entries. We see Apache 2.4.29 appears to be outdated. It is end of life for the branch. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, if we locate Apache, and you can see there's a bunch of Apache stuff obviously here that are gonna come pre-installed on Linux. Oh, if I scroll down, but here it is right here with Amoeba Sent. What happens to your leg stretching breaks? So balance hacking is important. I know, dude, when I take, so I probably should. Here's what I've noticed though. I really dislike having my train of thought interrupted. So like when I'm focusing on something, I don't like having to stop <laughs> for five minutes, but it is probably good practice to take breaks, but I'll take one soon. I just don't have a timer set because I just don't like taking breaks when I'm, when I'm focused on something like when I'm in the zone, um, I don't like doing that. So if you download Apache, we're going to install Apache to PHP, which I already did that. Edit, edit our configuration file. So the W get, when you grab this stuff down, you're gonna move it to var www slash HTML, okay? That's where you're gonna move those files to in order to run it properly. So that's one thing that might trip you up. Make sure, once again, when you download this, this is the file location, move it to this file location. I mean, there might be other ways to just run it locally, but that's how I did it. And then we need to edit our configuration files to use port 8080, which I think just the way I found that, I'll even show you like live in real time, the importance of Google, right? I just type I think I just did that. And we can see that there's an Apache 2.conf, right? So if we locate that, we have a few things there, right? I need to turn my music down a little bit. It got, it got too loud, at least for my ears while I'm concentrating. So let's glance at both of these. This is the main Apache server configuration file that the configuration directives that give the server its instructions. I'm gonna look what Amoeba Man just said. It is a good rabbit hole avoiding technique, but yeah, it breaks your thought process. Though for rabbit holes, that's a good thing during CTFs. Just give your brain time to catch up on all the information you have found. You know, that's a, that's an excellent point. Cause I've even noticed like in work, like my, my, my real job, the one that pays me on like Twitch, when I'm stuck on something, I can be really stuck on it, right? And then I just step away. Often it's at night, like I'm, I'm done for the day and I'm doing something completely unrelated and my brain's processing things, right? And all of a sudden a solution pops in my head. So I suppose that's true with breaks as well. Like just stepping away for a little bit and allowing your mind to process, especially if you get stuck, right? If you're stuck, that's probably a really good practice to step away. And honestly, it's probably a good practice to build it into my time and maybe we'll eventually get back to that. Maybe when I get stuck, we'll build it in. But um, here is the Apache configuration file. I think all I did was look for port. Oops, didn't mean that. So look at this, ports.conf is always included from the main configuration file. It is supposed to determine listening ports or incoming connections. So I read that and I was like, oh, okay. 
Look at that. G edit Etsy Apache Apache 2 ports.conf. So right, so just do a little bit of investigative work. And remember what it said. It said it wants you to listen on port 8080, right? So that that's all you do. You find this and you set that to listen. I believe that's all I had to do anyways. I don't know if it walks you through that or not, or if that was just my own uh, discovery. Yep, and then we're gonna start Apache, right? So system CTL start Apache 2. Okay. And now, if we open up our Andy Dandy web browser, we can close some of these out for now. Look at that. We are hosting our own Apache 2 web server right now, right here on localhost. Now, if we go to robots.txt, disallow PHP info. Now, just so you understand, because this will be helpful for you if this is new at all to you, even if it's not new, it's helpful to me. If we do ls on here, we can see the files here, right? So we can go to index.html, Debian index, lfi.php, rce, right? So local file inclusion, remote code execution, robots.txt. We have the secret directory. And we have catpix, pizza, png, right? So if we go back to our sheen, that's all, that's all the web server is, right? Secret dirt, was that what that was? Yeah. Hello, world. Mmm. I'm actually really hungry. That looks really good, to be honest with you. <laughs> that cat doesn't look as tasty, but maybe. Maybe if I was hungry enough. All right. Hopefully that makes sense for you guys, right? So we're, we're hosting this right now from here. And that's what a web server is. It's hosting different pages up, essentially, right? Often Linux, sometimes Windows with IIS. But let's let's go back to what it's going to ask us to do. What is this? Vulnerability? Now that you understand the file structure and infrastructure behind the web server, you can begin attacking it. Based on the technical errors and misconfigurations found on the web server, you, we can assume that the developer is not highly experienced. Use the information that you've already identified from asset discovery to move through the attack me me methodically. From OWASP, local file inclusion, also known as LFI, is the process of including files that are already locally present on the server through the exploiting of vulnerable inclusion procedures implemented in the application. LFI can be trivial to identify, typically found from parameters, commonly used when downloading files or referencing images. Remember, uh, img.php or whatever it was before. Example, oh, and it has it right there. To exploit this vulnerability, we need to utilize the attack known as directory traversal. From port swigger, directory traversal, also known as file path traversal, is a web security vulnerability that allows an attacker to read arbitrary files in the server that is running an application. This vulnerability is exploited by using a combination of dot dot slash and sequence to go back to the web server's root directory. So just think in Linux, CD, and then you do that. From here, you can read any files that the web server has access to. A common way of testing proof of concept for LFI is reading Etsy password which contrary to what it sounds like doesn't actually give the password but it does give the users and the passwords for linux are in etsy shadow find an example below from the test environment and the above example the question mark file parameter is a parameter that we exploit to gain lfi this is the entire concept of LFI. For the most part, LFI is used to chain to other exploits and provide further access like RCE. However, LFI can also give you some helpful insight and enumerate the target system depending on the access level web server. An example of using LFI to read files is finding an interesting file while fuzzing. However, you get a 403 error. You can use LFI to read the file and bypass the error code. Okay, cool. So let me show you guys this in practice. We know that we have cat picks, right? go like here we also know we have all these different ones we have is it just lfi php is that going to be our way i'd assume whoops file does not exist right nope oh, i did that wrong I should grab, I may get my syntax wrong a little bit. PHP question mark file equals. Well, let's try to do 
Well, there's cat picks. Let's try cat picks. Maybe it doesn't do it for like something simple like robots.txt. Is that not? See, I don't think I even did this on my own web server. Once I had it set up, I just went straight to the machine we're supposed to attack. Is this not image.php? Ours would be the lfi.php, I'm pretty sure. Oh, we need file. What am I doing, y'all? We need file. We need to specify that we're looking for a file. See? There we go. Hello, world. And let's see if we can read my own. It doesn't really matter how many days you do, right? Well, I mean, it does. You got to do a few. And look at that. We can read the Etsy password of my machine. We can see we got Cali there, right? That's my main account. So, whoops. Cool, right? So if we if we consider all this, consider all this, hopefully things are beginning to click in your mind. So if we go back and look at this, let's remember that we have, whoops, what the fuzz? We have this. Secret directory slash creds.txt and we have image.php hmm hopefully it's clicking your head how we can use image.php question mark file equals to access this because it's on the web server right let me show you guys let's go to our dev.hollow live I already forgot what it was. Image.php, right? Yeah, so if we just do nothing, right? Hmm. We got the Etsy password of the web server. And look, we know it's running MySQL. I bet. We'll be accessing that later. We got WW data, right? That's a standard service account for the web server. But what was the creds called? You guys remember? Creds.txt, right? How do I forget that? Oh, we, we have to specify the full path, sorry. If we specify the full path, we should be able to read those creds. I know you forget things, so I'm leaving this note for you. Admin DB manager login, right? Username, password. What do we do, my friends, when we find that? Well, we record it in our handy dandy notebook. I feel like Loose Clues. Yeah, my cat feels like Loose Clues too behind me meowing. There we go. We got some creds, y'all. Thank you for the note, Gurog. So there's a few things I notice here. We have admin and then we have a password and we have another potential username. Maybe some type of admin is named Gurog. Maybe that'll come up later. Maybe if we find another password, we could possibly use that username and um, try to brute force that username to maybe SSH access or something along those lines. I don't know if we're gonna do that in the room. We haven't got to that, but I noticed that must be some type of username on the server, right? So notice details like that. If there's an about me page on a website, you can also look at that. If you get the syntax of how they set up their usernames and AD, you can use an about me page and uh, compile a essentially a word list of usernames so that you can use later on, whether it's uh, brute forcing logins or if you find some passwords or trying common passwords against those usernames that helps lower um, what you're going after make it a little more accurate oh let's go let's go back was there anything else we had to do oh so it's just asking us for that so we already did all that and you know what i'm going to take amoeba man's advice i want to stand up let's take a five minute break I've been going now for an hour and eight minutes straight. So I think it's time for a five minute break. I'm going to throw up the five minute break screen, y'all. Um, I'll be back in five minutes. I encourage you also to get up, do some jumping jacks, and we'll start hacking again in five minutes.
Welcome back, everybody. Time for some more hacking. Then share my screen because I forget that half the time. And we ended up here. Let's dive into remote control stuff, shall we? Now that you have access to the administrator subdomain, you can fuzz for remote code execution and attempt to identify a specific parameter that you can exploit to gain arbitrary access to the machine. Let me show you guys. I didn't actually fuzz for this, but I found it a different way. Um, so our creds for this, if you remember right, are admin. Oh, I say I apparently saved it, and a DB manager login, right? Jeez, dude, my cat sounds like a mountain lion or something. I don't know if you guys can hear it. Now he's like howling somewhere in the basement. I still can't see him. <laughs> Terrifying. What's our notification? Software's out of date. Please update. All right, so we can kind of look around. We can play on this. Oh, uh, that's cool. That's broken. But we see we have some dashboard here. Let's look at our page source. So we have Material Dashboard Dark Edition, version 2.1.0. All right, we have this administrator panel. Okay, nothing interesting yet. We just have colors being set. Here's our dashboard. And hold up, I'm gonna get Twitch pulled up on my side so I see the chat in case I miss anything. Okay, all right, let's keep going through here. JavaScript stuff, JavaScript, drop down menu. Yeah, so that's all navigation bar. Hmm. Visitors today. You guys see that? And we have this comment here. If get CMD equals null, so nothing. Echo, pass through, cat. Their cat, they're, they're reading out from the temp directory on the web server, views dot text, else echo pass through get. Now I'm just curious if we take that, do we still have our thing open? Yeah, what if we go like this? Eighty-three visitors today, right? So all it's doing is reading this file. Whoops. But look at this: the CMD equals null. Else echo pass through get command. Now, if you were to fuzz this guy, I think what you'd find. There would be. Um, Maybe it's, is it dashboard.php? Yeah, right? I don't know why I was thinking this command. Dashboard.php, you can kind of see when I was doing this before, we can command and then we can say like, who am I? And look, it pulls it up right here. We have remote code execution right here. We can do ls. We can see what's all here. We have our super secret directory, how the live action page, right? Now to put things together, right? So if we wanted to like CD, you have to do plus, I, I learned. And it's obviously not gonna list anything. Kind of like that. No, that doesn't work. I wonder if we could do. No, it doesn't work either. <laughs> but anyways, we have remote code execution. Now, if you fuzzed it like they're saying, uh, I believe you'd find it that way as well. And oh, it even shows you CMD right there. We can gain RCE on the box or we can attempt to. So what file is vulnerable? Dashboard.php. What parameter is vulnerable? Of course, CMD what users the web server running as. And if you remember, we got that just by running who am I. So just think, we have remote code execution. So we can run commands on the web server. Well, don't you think that we could get a shell right on the web server? 
There's a few different ways we can do that. I don't know if Netcat's on here or not. It's Python. I have to imagine that cat is. Let's jump back to the instructions quick. Appreciate sure what's going to have us do. You see, I haven't actually done this part yet. Now that we have, oh, we have a shell. Oh, am I supposed to get shell? Oh, yeah, it's telling us right there um to identify rce you can decide whether you want to fuzz parameters you can approach or review the source code that's what we did once you have rce on the system you can use your first cell such as netcat that's what i thought but i thought it would pull up if i did which netcat so if we look through here let me show you guys a cool a cool tool that i found rev shell i think someone sent this to me i think it's called rev shell reverse shell generator look at this so we specify our IP and our port and our listener. It tells us what to do for our listener. If we do, let's scroll down to netcat dot E. We do reverse shell. So it's telling us our command to run on our victim machine and then what to run on our attack machine for our listener. You can, you can generate all these different shells, which I thought was cool. So we can literally copy that. We'll do 1337. Um, like I said, I haven't actually got to this part. So I think this will work, but maybe it won't. Maybe we'll have to do some digging or troubleshooting. If we just do it this way, I don't believe it works. I think you need to do pluses, right? I don't, yeah, we didn't get any call back. Go like this. Each time there's a space, I believe you have to plus on here. Hmm. Oh, I have a different IP now. From when I was first using that. 10.50.104.39. Hmm. That didn't work either. Hmm. Let's update. Let's try, let's try pen test monkey because that's what I usually use. It's right here. Netcat dash E. Yeah, this is what we were doing. And it says netcat's are rarely present, so maybe it's not actually on the machine. So let's just get our syntax right here. Right, so netcat dash e as an execute, I believe is what that stands for. We can do our IP here. Maybe there's a firewall. Maybe we need to use a more common port. We'll try it with just the spaces built in first. All right. We'll add our pluses where there's spaces. Maybe we can upload a shell. Oh, if we die, if we upload like a, I'd assume like a PHP shell or something might work. Whoa, no, close. Okay, 
let's look at this PHP reverse shell. All we should have to do is change our IP to match our IP. Port, we'll do 1337. Save. And clear ls. Let's just rename it and we'll just call it shell.php for ease of use. Let's start a Python web server. Just Python 3 m for module, HTTP server. We'll run down port 80 for simplicity. And now, knowing that we have remote code execution, I'm wondering if we can just wget plus 10.50.104.39 for IP shell.php. I'm doing something wrong. I'm not getting any connection. Maybe it's not pluses. I could have swore it was though. This string commands together. One oh four dot thirty nine. Ten dot fifty one oh four dot thirty nine. I'm, I'm missing something, y'all. Um, so I tried URL encoding. Like application that uses plus instead of that for space is what I thought. Is there like a web application firewall blocking me? If I change the port to... What would be a different command I could run with the space in it? What do we have here? Gosh, my cat's annoying. Back hurts. So if we did Maybe it's not pluses. Cat, be quiet. You're annoying. I'm, I'm missing something obvious, I'm pretty sure. Um, I wonder, I wonder. For those of you watching on Twitch, if you see something obvious I'm missing, holler at me, let me know what it is. I'm looking through my OneNote notes. Gosh, I'm not sure.
Twitch. What if you just do spaces without pluses for something you know works? I think I tried that, but let's try it again. So, if we, like, we should be able to cat robots.txt, right? Like, cat out a file in the current directory. Yeah. Like, robots.txt should work because it's in the current directory. Well, I am glancing at a guide for this room just to see if I'm missing something super obvious. Scrolling down, I'm not gonna go far in the guide, just far enough to see what we might be missing. Matter of fact, I'll pull it over here. I just don't wanna go too far. We did all this, we did all this. Okay. Yep, we looked at all this stuff. Oh my goodness, you know what we're doing wrong? I, we don't, it's the freaking quotations, y'all. Look at this. Can you believe that? It's just the quotations. It's because I had quotations around the command. Gosh. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm thinking it's like a firewall blocking me. Look at that. That's all we were doing wrong, y'all. We can go back to listen on 1337 because we're elite hackers. We can close our thing right there and let's go ahead and grab let's close our walkthrough let's grab and i will just say i used to think looking at walkthroughs is cheating that's not cheating right because the goal is to learn so don't feel bad if you glance at a walkthrough i just if you do look at a walkthrough only look far enough until you're no longer stuck right let's grab the netcat shell on here. Oh, I still have it open in Notepad, I bet. Shell. We did it, y'all. We did it. We have a shell. We're probably going to stabilize a shell, I'd assume. Okay. Now that we have shell on the box, we, oh, we want to stabilize our shell. <laughs> For the most part, stabilizing shells is straightforward by using other utilities like Python to help. However, some steps can take longer or change depending on the shell you use. The blow instructions will be for Bash and ZSH. Any other shells or operating systems, you'll need to do your own research. Okay, instructions found throughout this room are inspired by this fantastic blog post. Ooh. This looks good. You know what I have in my notebook? My handy dandy notebook. We got helpful tools. And I even have reverse shell tools here. Let's post that there. So we have it for reference. Okay. There are several ways to stabilize a shell. We'll be focused on using Python to create a pseudo terminal and modifying STTY options. The steps are the same for all target machines, but they differ depending on the shell or operating system to be used. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and do side by side. Oh, I lost my mouse. Jeez. If that, if that glitched out for you guys on Twitch, my computer froze. <laughs> doing, doing too much with it. Um, blah, blah, blah. To begin with, create a pseudo terminal using Python. So I've done this a few times.
Uh, does it not have Python on the box? Can't clear. Oh, sure enough, you're right. Good call. Oh, I, I might have to type it. And now let's copy this from here. I think there's a different way to do it with Python 3. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Gosh, it's getting too late for me, guys. Thanks for catching that. Once we have a pseudo shell, we can pause the terminal and modify STTY options to optimize the terminal. Follow the steps below exactly, exactly for bash shells. Okay, STTY, raw, echo, FG. We need to pause the shell first, don't we? Oh, and you should be able to do just Python 3. So you don't have to do the user bin. Yeah, because it's in the bin. Um, let's look at this. I'm pretty sure we have to like get out of the shell first. But I always freaking screw it up when I do it. So Python 3, let you run SU, for example. Unfortunately, it doesn't get around some of the issues of live love. Signet control C will still close netcat and there's no tab completion in history, but it's a quick and dirty workaround that's helped me numerous times. Using SoCat. What's an upgrade from netcat with magic? What's this? Follow the same technique as what method one and use Python to spawn PTY. Once bash is running and the PTY I did my shell with sh. Do I need to do it with bash? Oh, yeah, we suspended it. So let's follow the steps there. Good call. So now if we do stty raw echo fg reset. I don't think I'm doing it right. Um, I'm hitting enter. When I hit enter, it does carrot key M. <laughs> oh, right after the FG. I think I broke it for now. I'm a late hacker, guys. I can't get out of it. Yeah, I mess this up 90% of the time. I suck at stabilizing shells. RIP, so many of the shells and even my entire Kelly. <laughs> Dude, I suck at it too. Every time I do it, I screw it up. Um, okay, we're gonna go like this. Is it not Z S H? Oh wait, that killed my thing. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Oh well, let's just set up our netcat again. No big deal. Oh, maybe it is a big deal. Shoot, this still has the connection here. Can we reload this page? Gosh, did I screw up the freaking web server? Because it still has a connection to me. Can I... 
I'm listening on the same port. It's not going to let me log in now. Look at that. We broke it, guys. Good job. I can't use dashboard.php right now. <laughs> well, at least it's almost midnight. Let's see. Well, we got we got caught up to where I was at because I didn't get to that part. Yep, RIP. Let's have a moment of silence for this box. There's not really a good way to reset it either. Sorry, everyone. If anyone else is on the subnet, I apologize for breaking the box. So, what we're going to do, we're going to go up here. We're going to leave. We're going to leave the room. We're going to hope that when we connect tomorrow night, we, <laughs> we have a different network <laughs> that's not broken. But... We got a lot done, guys. We did it for an hour and, and 40 minutes or so. So I'd say that is a good start. We didn't we didn't break the box for an hour and 40 minutes. So we will remember for tomorrow night when we're back on. Do it right the first time because apparently you can't get another shell. <laughs> so we'll, we'll keep that in mind. Tomorrow, instead of SH, I might try bash. And okay, XI Sparks 1, Python dash C, import PTTY, PTTY spawn, and bash control Z. Hit enter. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna copy your comments real quick. Whoops. Oh wait, that's not where I want to go. And if we, I'm gonna look forward actually at Holo. Can I look at it without joining? Yeah, so if we, I'm just going to glance forward to see where we're going to go. Like, maybe I'm good just using a basic shell. All right, there. We're going to stabilize the shell. We know from looking through some files. Oh, so maybe it is a good idea to stabilize the shell. What's with this screenshot? Someone, like, took it with their phone <laughs> instead of a legit screenshot. <laughs> you guys see that? So we will probably have to stabilize our shell. That's fine. We'll probably spend the next like four streams trying to stabilize a stupid shell. I mean, I could probably do most of this with just the Python shell, I would think. I'll practice offline. I'll see if I can get it before tomorrow night. But hey, guys. Pull this up. Thank you for hanging out with me. Appreciate you guys helping me along on this journey. Um, I will be back. Hopefully tomorrow night. That's the plan. I do have to do some work stuff tomorrow night, but it's not until after my stream. And so I will be streaming from around 10 p.m. Central Time to around midnight Central Time. Or if I break the network, maybe shorter. <laughs> we'll see what's going on. But thank you guys again for joining. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed to me on YouTube, just Google Tyler Ramsby on YouTube. You should be able to find my YouTube page. And I always post these recordings after the fact on YouTube. So you can follow along there. They're also on Twitch. But Twitch gets mad at me because I have music in the background and then it mutes the audio. But YouTube doesn't care because they don't monetize my videos. So thank you guys again for joining. And I will catch you guys tomorrow night. Peace.